and how we helped our clients with this. Um, Dr. Yeager and I will walk you through um, the predictive models. Uh, I will spend some time on how we do the data aggregation and create the risk models in there. Uh, talk about how we did the predictions of ER, which was very important during the COVID time. And then Dr. Yeager will walk you through the care interventions and the actionable outcomes that we were able to take into the market. Um, very quickly, um, what I'm going to be reviewing over here are the um, risk stratification specifically for cancer patients. But at Healthy C, we have also utilized the John Hopkins, Bill the RAF, the CDCP, and multiple internal risk stratification using our own machine learning and AI algorithms with our data scientists. Um, for the specific cancer patients, we actually worked with the Charleston Core Morbidity and found that it stratified but didn't do as great a job as we needed it to, even though we did the weighted combination for 22 core morbidities. But when we added the C3 with the 42 additional diagnosis and did the weightage, plus added on to it some of our intelligence we have learned um, from the populations we have managed for 10 plus years, uh, we were able to then um, create a high risk score for these patients. So the high risk score would be your patients of high risk. What we further did was um, analyze based upon Dr. Yeager and the clinical team input on how to stratify them for susceptibility for COVID. Dr. Yeager will walk you through some of those more details as we go forward. So typically the higher the risk, the higher the probability of you being um, uh, likelihood of a hospitalization. What we did further with after risk stratifying it and predicting the ER admissions, we created the cohorts that would be important for is a case management or care coordination, and those that would really fall in for the geriatric assessments and more of the palliative care part of it. HealthyC has been working with value-based contracts and OCM clients for the past 10 years, and we have created some very innovative care coordination, um, actionable outcomes and interventions, which help guide the care coordination team on the care intelligence platform, which we are partnered with, with LabCorp, uh, to identify the cohorts of patients that need to be uh, called upon, have a one touch point with them, and we have year over year shown a reduction in ER and hospital visits with the clients that, we, that are on this platform. Furthermore, we took it to the next level, especially for the cancer patients um, and working with the um, <clears throat> industry leaders to create some palliative care programs, some uh, one touch point programs uh, that would then allow us to do an outreach, the care coordinators to do an outreach on the platform, gather all the information so we can further mine it to see how the population is faring on it. This is a pretty complex diagram we have over here, but this is the guts or the backbone of what we do. So our strength really lies in being able to bring EMR data. We have 200 plus connectors that we have built and support. Uh, bring data from your health plans or uh, the state or the Medicaid, which will have your beneficiary data and your claims data. Uh, bring in assessment data, bring in some SDOH data points, and very importantly in this case, the lab corp data. And currently we are able to get data for either a population or for a group on a daily basis from them. And this data is not just limited to your regular um, preventive care type of uh, lab results, but also goes on to pathology as well as the biomarker, which we use our machine learning and NLP programs to extract important information that will further help stratify the patient population that we are working with. Needless to say, the pharma data is very critical. And um, so all of this data run through our quality rules, which we have experienced for 20 plus years. Before coming into population health, we were a clearinghouse and an HIE, and then used our skills and our knowledge to further integrate more data sets to do the data cleansing, the data transformation. Of course, you have to explore the data to make sure it fits in with the, with the quality that you require um, to be able to do machine learning further down. 
So we constantly revisit and ensure this data is of a good quality and has the depth that we need on that particular patient population so we can run some machine learning algorithms as well as some AI on top of that with the neural, with the neural networks and the deep neural networks. Um, and then since two years, we've been working on this model. Last year, we started the validation process with some of the practices, large practices in the Eastern region um, to validate what we had done. And now we confidently are coming out to say we can take this data and blend it into our care intelligence platform on the analytics side and the care coordination side, allowing multiple stakeholders to take advantage of a use case that we have put together. And COVID is, was one of them that Dr. Yeager will talk some more details to you. So in a nutshell, it really is trying to give you a 360 degrees view of that patient so that we are able to correctly mine the data and create the risk stratification to provide interventions, care interventions to get good outcomes. Um, so at a, at a care coordination, like I was mentioning ahead before to you, um, since this data is not just about the cancer the patient has and what they're going through, we actually do pull information from the EMR, from the EMR of the oncologist or those that are in that clinically integrated network, we are able to better identify all the comorbidities of this patient, all the meds they are on, what type of assessments they have had. That is what is starting to improve the probability of what we are able to predict. And so far, we have been able to predict at a 90%. CMS actually had a challenge out there with 200 people participated, and we were one of the top 20 people to be selected in the second round. And we're waiting for the next set um, of um, awards to come out. And I think our team has done a fabulous job in trying to, do, to predict as close as we can for not only the high risk, but also what is the unplanned hospital admissions that we are going to have. The data then can be explored in an analytic tool you can do some an interactive dashboard, visualization, geomapping, tons of 200 plus reports are available. Furthermore, you can take this data and render it in the Care Intelligence Care Connect platform, allowing care coordinators, care navigators, case managers, social, um, uh, social workers, any business use who needs to take care of that patient to have access to all this information in a single view, allowing the patient care to be improved. To now step back and talk you through what we have done in the past two months, since March actually, since the COVID came in, came about and all of us have been you know, stranded, homebound. Um, our team has worked tirelessly to try and pull this data and to identify. Um, so again, we are we're getting health plan data, like I had mentioned. We're able to get the lab result data, those that are positive and negative. We connect to multiple HIEs in the states or through partners who are able to provide us the admissions and the discharge summary information. So we're able to leverage information that is coming from the hospitals. Um, we run it through our gateway platform, which is a CMS certified, high trust certified universal data warehouse with decision support um, to do risk stratification and tracking, not just cancer patient. It can do it for the whole patient population at a health plan level, a state level, or at a CIN or a practice level. Identifying our high risk patients, geomapping them, identifying those that are tested and then the next step is to do more of a disease surveillance. We may have missed it right now, but if the second wave is, as we starting to um, hear about from the industry leaders, could be coming in October, November, how do we get ahead of it today so that we're not scrambling again? So again, the objective and the deliverables which the team put together in less than four weeks was to identify the high risk, specifically those that are at 
risk for COVID, not just high risk. So if you had 3,000 patients, how do you narrow it down to 300 or 100 so that it is easier for us to do the outreach and get to them? And how do you find the right patients in that pool of patients that you're trying to manage? So get a targeted outreach out to our clients on the platform and directly to them at the practice or the physician level. So we can tell them for this practice, these are the 20 patients or these are the 30 patients that we need to reach away right away. So if you're running an ACO or a value-based contract or just consciously trying to take care of your patient population, it's a perfect tool for you to bring in. Now incorporating into it your COVID-19 test. So what we try to do is not only find those that are negative, we want to get all the tests because that's what we get for the population. We're able to find those that went for a test, that means they're susceptible, whether they were positive or negative and the outcome for them. And we continue to create these clusters, overlaying it with the hospital's practices and providers, allowing us to know where is that red box becoming bigger and do we have enough resources in that area to take care of this population. And of course, once we add the ADT, which is the admission discharge, uh, data from the hospitals, we are able to do even a further uh, prediction or start to find where the other patients had gone and if someone was found with a positive, how do you start to do a surveillance and take it to the next level using more of machine learning and AI? Um, our data on the geomapping can be by county, by zip code, down to the street, we can overlay it on any of the geo maps that are being rented out there. The core is to get the data right. And that is what our expertise comes from. Uh, with this, I'd really like to hand it over to Dr. Yeager, our expert, and who has helped build this whole program for COVID intervention. Thank you, Sita. So that was a, a great explanation of how we get to the workflow and a nice overview of the, the workflow as well. I'm going to give a little bit more background into um, <clears throat> some of the COVID-specific work. So with regard to identifying our highest risk patients, of course, it was based on the prospective risk scores and the uh, AI business rules that uh, Sita just mentioned. We started with age and the known comorbidities that came out of WHO and CDC guidelines. From there, we also added notes from the field, uh, from investigating groups across the country, uh, across the globe, really, as well as the published literature in the United States to get a better sense of what's going on here in our country. And our populations are certainly seeing a little bit different in terms of demographics uh, than what we had seen elsewise. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, as, as Sita mentioned, the idea is to support an overburdened healthcare workforce. We, we know that uh, most people now are staying at home, but how do you reach the, the key individuals? If um, Medicare is everybody over 65, well, then that's everybody in your Medicare population. And since we know the various comorbidities uh, that are, in fact, uh, affected, that's most of your Medicaid population, and you can't reach uh, even diligent care managers can't reach everybody. Uh, and so the idea is to provide support for non-medical personnel uh, to understand who their highest risk patients are, uh, and not just for um, severe COVID infection, but then also try to identify who is currently symptomatic and needs a brick and mortar evaluation, let's say in an emergency department, uh, and who needs to be managed at home and how to do that safely. So this high risk patient uh, population, is uh, available to the um, to our uh, clients and practices either standalone or can be incorporated into the care intelligence um, population health management platform. And once it's integrated into the platform, uh, it then is um, uh, filled with the um, all of the um, clinical information that's available on those patients. So you know who has um, uh, what type of cancer, who is uh, underlying immunosuppression, who's on high-dose steroids or chemotherapy, and you can further prioritize or filter populations as you would need. Uh, the uh, COVID assessment survey is also available within this program and is the first step for the care manager to quickly identify who needs to be seen now for COVID. 
uh, and who needs to be followed up quickly over the next several days uh, to see how they're progressing. And the uh, scoring, again, based on the logic that CETA went through, maps to one of four different risk levels with associated action plans. And these plans are a set of informed interventions that auto-populate the uh, care manager's dashboard, triggering a set of recommendations that, again, using your clinical expertise, you may choose wants, uh, you want to include or you don't want to include, uh, but that are available uh, quickly and easily within the platform. And they can be uh, managed as well to goals and interventions with triggers for updates. In addition, we can see, uh, as we know, the social determinants of health become a great issue, as we have seen the unintended consequences of social distancing means that patients aren't being um, seen in, the, in person. So we, we understand that there are problems with domestic violence increasing, child abuse. We know that there's uh, increase in substance use, either alcohol, or opiates, or other drugs uh, because of depression as well as uh, the financial instability. We understand, again, being distancing, there's uh, impaired access either to medications uh, or to um, appropriate food. And so these kinds of assessments all, are all included in our um, uh, program. It's part of the population health management uh, platform, but accessible as well next to the assessment. So this is the actual assessment. It's uh, the outward-facing one, uh, so it has some pretty icons, and you'll see another one that uh, we have as part of, within the program. And the first two questions assess age, whether you're over 65 or the higher uh, risk group of individuals over 80. The next two boxes um, going across horizontally are the uh, risk factors underlying medical conditions that we know are associated uh, with COVID, and not just the ones which were initially identified, but newer ones. We understand is the um, obesity, BMI greater than 40, and smoking, as very uh, other conditions, and then looking at the risk of immunosuppression. Uh, there's been some controversy as to whether uh, folks who are uh, have underlying immunosuppression are at higher risk, but we know that in general they're at higher risk for infections, and so we have a way of looking at that there. The next three questions have to do with signs and symptoms. Those warning signs are signs that would suggest that an individual needs to be seen right away either followed up with a PCP or an oncologist immediately or possibly referred to an emergency room, and they could be related to uh, COVID or to underlying medical conditions. One of the things that, unfortunately, we're seeing now are individuals who, because they are trying to avoid exposure and told not to go to the emergency room, are actually uh, at home suffering uh, from uh, issues that they should have gone to the emergency room, and we're seeing uh, <clears throat> much more morbidity as a result of that. And so we really need to make sure that we're, we have touch points on these individuals and refer them when we need to. And then the other two have to do with uh, potential uh, signs or symptoms that should be followed up or ones that are rather mild. And then the last box looks at uh, risk of exposure. Now this um, assessment can be done either one time and, and referred on and or um, obtained over time to see how they're evolving. The logic, the scoring is weighted and is based on our AI model that uh, CETA has already gone through. And in fact, I have, with um, comparison to what is going on in the patient population, also helps you to identify who the contacts are of high risk members. So, this next one is a, uh, if we were to have a demo, you'd be able to see me just popping into each of these screens. But here's a snapshot looking at. Uh, what the care manager would see when she logs in or he logs in, and that's the first um, box on the bottom there. And the, the highlight, um, there you go, the, <laughs> this is uh, going to the yellow highlight, which is the COVID-19 program. So when the care manager logs in, they can select a program for COVID-19, and all attributed members that have been identified as high risk will pop up on their dashboard right there on the bottom. By clicking on the icon that's actually a, an index finger, that individual's entire record uh, will pop up, again, providing all of the information uh, that we have in terms of uh, EMR results and claims. Everything that uh, CETA has already gone through is all in a one-stop uh, one 
uh, shopping, so to speak. And the tab along the left shows the various assessments. You can click on the uh, COVID assessment, and in this last the top box, that's the uh, assessment that is seen from the inside, so facing the uh, care manager. Again, going through a set of questions, the score of which will then map to our one of four action plans, which I think is on the next screen. And so based on the score, we will uh, make a set of recommendations and uh, a level of urgency. A score of nine or above suggests that this individual really needs to be seen immediately. Uh, and again, yeah, they're calling your uh, physician or 911 as needed. The next two action plans, two and three, are uh, individuals who are, have signs of symptoms of uh, COVID-19, and they're at risk for having severe infection should they become infected. And these folks need to be seen uh, or evaluated in follow-up. And so again, the, the um, care manager's um, dashboard will be uh, set with triggers for following up the next day or in uh, 48 hours. And the various other assessments that are included allow us to see where their other needs are. So if, if we're referring somebody for um, at the top level here, action one, that they need to go into an emergency room right away, they're not also triggered to uh, assess for infection control practices within the house and reviewing signs and symptoms. This person needs to be seen right away. But these uh, subsequent action plans will um, trigger other assessments for uh, depression and uh, food insecurity uh, and uh, signs and symptoms related to management of their chronic uh, underlying conditions, all of which, uh, all of these high-risk patients have underlying chronic medical conditions, and these also need to be managed uh, and making sure that we uh, aren't losing sight of somebody's cardiac issues or pulmonary issues or, or end-stage renal disease uh, as we are keeping them at home. And then the last one, again, is just action four, which is uh, no signs or symptoms and can be followed up as needed. So this next uh, is an example of our geomapping. And so as Asita said, we can overlay various groups. Just for simplicity in demonstrating here, because we can't drill in, uh, we've only put two categories here, which is uh, the orange dots are the high-risk patients that we've identified, and the red are the uh, COVID positive um, members within these, these um, patient so cohorts. We can also, as Peter mentioned, include all the attributed or active members of your population so that you can see where your high risk uh, cohorts are. Tracking this over real time, uh, as Peter mentioned, we have, um, we get uh, test results from LabCorp on a daily basis. And so you can actually track in real time the leading edge of, your, of, a, of a cluster. You can see where you need to focus your contact tracing because of increasing positive cases. And you can identify within your high-risk members who are our potential contacts and, I, and continue to reach out to those individuals proactively. You can then overlay hospital practice and provider data. So you can uh, have uh, resource allocation into the areas that are expanding in terms of uh, positive patients. When you overlay that with those who have been tested and negative, you learn two things. One, who the susceptible uh, people um, or remaining susceptible individuals are, uh, who you're going to want to focus when we have a vaccine available down the line. Um, obviously, if they've already been infected, you don't need to uh, provide a vaccine for those individuals. Um, and as well, you're going to see where the gaps are in terms of treatment, I mean, uh, testing. You want to make sure that everybody is being tested uh, that needs to be tested. And so ideally, you would like not to see an individual who is high risk who doesn't either have a positive or a negative test. And so that brings us to this, this last um, slide. It is the integration of all of the, the data sources that we have and starts with a high risk patient here, our, our gentleman. 65, hypertension, diabetes. Uh, and he is, um, he's been identified in this top left um, yellow box as a high-risk patient. He has had uh, kind of his care manager reach out to him, provide the survey and assessment, identify what his needs may be, what his signs and symptoms are, and has initiated this care management program. 
recommending that this person get tested because he's at high risk. He, we get a test, um, either positive or negative, we will get the results of a test uh, in real time, and that triggers a retrospective analysis if it's positive. We can look back and take a look at the period of time, what we call incubation period, when he first reported symptoms, to when he first had his test. We can take a look at where he was seen and pre adjudicated claims data, which allows us to see who he went to see, where he was seen, uh, and so you can identify who the other contacts were within the healthcare um, system, allowing a uh, much more targeted uh, and accurate contact tracing for individuals. And then moving forward, we can um, include cost and utilization for these positive individuals so that you can take a look in within your healthcare uh, facility at a population level, what the costs and, um, uh, were attributed specifically to COVID-19. And then with the availability of serial testing, follow these individuals for immunity and a scale on that person. So um, I don't think I've left much time now for questions, but I think there looks like there's a minute left. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Yeager. Thank you, Dr. Yeager, and thank you, Sita. Um, again, mute yourself and go ahead and ask right now, or you can put them in the chat and we can read them off for you as well. Um, I see one coming up in the chat already. How can health plan participants listen to this presentation again? Um, we are recording this presentation. Did anyone want to take that question or I, I, um, I, think, yeah. I think we can Amy, okay. this is Celeste. I think we can set that up individually with the plan and the managed care representative. So, um, assuming that we have one, I think Brenda is on. So, I will I'll confer with her on that. Sounds good. Any other questions? Hi, this is Lori Scott. Um, I just had a question earlier, Cita, when you were talking about the different analytics that um, would be reviewed, you mentioned the lab data. So that's kind of a two-part question. Um, how do, do clients access or how do you access the lab core data? And then specifically for cancer patients, what biomarkers are we accessing? Sure. So uh, there is a three-party agreement that is signed with the client and with uh, LabCorp, which allows us access to the data, either, like I said, at the, if, it's a, if you're a CIN, it's at the uh, provider level, but if you're a value-based contract or an ACO or a health plan, which has um, the line of sight to get all the lab data, we are able to get all the lab data, no matter where that patient went and who prescribed it, um, who, who gave the order that lab result. And um, we have had the system up and running for five plus years, getting lab data. Um, they were coming in weekly, but now we're getting them on a daily basis. Thank you, LabCorp, because our clients are really happy to be getting it at a higher frequency. We further are working with them, um, and we are going through, you could uh, complete the FISH, the IHC, molecular, NGS, all those labs, whether it's coming from pathology or from IOM, are going to be feeding into this system, and biomarkers like HER2, PDL1, P53, all of ERs, KI67, I could go on, all of those biomarkers are going to be uniquely identified within the system. We're actually working with the uh, uh, chief medical officers at LabCorp and two other practices to help us identify how best they would like to use this data with all the clinical and all the financial data in one data store. So this is breaking ground as we speak, but that's where we are today. Thank you. Uh, just to add, we can get lab data even from the hospitals and the EMR, so we don't limit it on where we get the data from, as long as we get the data. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'd like to thank everybody for being on this call. Um, my email and Dr. Yeager's email is here. We are more than happy to answer any more questions you may have. 
any details, this presentation will be made available through LabCorp to you all. Um, and thank you for taking this time and listening to us. We appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And, and we will stay on for any questions for a few more minutes. Um, and I should have mentioned if you are trying to unmute yourself, there's a little microphone button that you need to click on. You can either hover at the bottom of your screen or find your name in the participants list to unmute yourself. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, um, you can feel free to reach out individually or to your sales representative. And uh, again, we thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.